Knees and hips, muscles and tendons, the hardware that carries around the software of our bodies. Tonight, we look into orthopedics. The doctors are on call now. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Close captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System and Fishback Financial Corporation. There's the, the bell. And which was healthier, the yogurt and the bagel? I'm going to start by measuring the size of it. You could also add grilled chicken to this recipe. Whoa, 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 keep pushing. Pull red handle to open bag. Good evening. Orthopedic surgery is a field of surgery which, is, uh, which addresses physical problems involving bones and muscles, the so-called musculoskeletal system. These surgical specialists involve surgical and non-surgical methods to treat musculoskeletal trauma, sports injuries, degenerative diseases, infections, ulcers, tumors, and congenital disorders. Selection for residency training in this field is very competitive and each year in the U.S. only about 700 surgeons complete the five years of training in order to practice orthopedics. Only three to four percent of practicing physicians are orthopedic surgeons, yet we ask this hard-working group of surgeons to treat an ever-growing number of cases. There are orthopedists which with special interest in surgery of the knee, foot and ankle, spine, shoulder and elbow, hand, and those with extra training for orthopedic trauma, musculoskeletal cancer, and orthopedic sports medicine, to name a few of the subspecialty areas. Today, we are blessed to have Dr. Pete Luby, who has an extra special training in sports medicine. He went to medical school at Washington U at St. Louis, orthopedic residency at the University of New Mexico, and a fellowship in orthopedic sports medicine at Harvard. And, and the Mass General Hospital. There in Boston, he was the team physician for the New England Patriots, the Boston Bruins hockey team, and others. Presently, he is the team surgeon for sports at STSU and the Sioux Falls Storm, among others. After this time uh, with Dr. Luby, you will most certainly better understand the nature of knee injuries in youth sports and how to prevent such a thing. Other injuries specific to sports, but also your interest in hip surgeries, knee surgeries, shoulder surgeries for degenerative joint disease. We will answer your questions about back pain and hand surgery or whatever you ask us. We invite you at home to call with your questions. Our phone number is 1-888-3766-225. Again, that is 1-888-3766-225. 376-6225. So that's a great introduction. I mean, I think the most impressive thing is Uni Washington University School of Medicine. I mean, that's like the top three med schools in the country. Well, thanks, Rick. That, that was a fabulous introduction. I'm not sure I deserve it. But it is true, I went to Washington University in St. Louis, and uh, we used to always consider it uh, one of the top five medical schools in the country yeah. and uh, we used to when we were med students there we used to say being at Wash U is like renting a car from Avis they, they were second so they tried harder they just yeah. beat the heck out of us yeah. every day down yeah. there you yeah. know? I know I, and Emory we were we're 20th in the in the US world and news report so where I was at they went well 
we, we're not second. <laughs> <laughs> when, but, we'd, when we'd walk through the halls of uh, the main lobby at Wash U, they had all the Nobel Prize winners from Wash U and, and their photographs and what they had done and their names. And, uh, and it, the, somebody never failed to make the point that the Soviet Union had like three or four Nobel Prize winners and Wash U had like 17 or something yeah, like I that, mean, you know? <laughs> it is amazing what a, a class act Wash U is. There's no question about that. People really don't realize in St. Louis, which is a tough town, I, I think, probably to live. It was a little bit for us. My wife and I were down there uh, for those four years in St. Louis, and I uh, got my motorcycle stolen down there. It was yeah. literally picked up from the back of our house one day and yeah. moved out of there. We kind of lived right on the edge of what had been rehabbed and what hadn't been, you know. So some of our neighborhood kind of looked at our part of the neighborhood uh, as a shopping mall. I yeah. Think <laughs> yeah, you're in the shopping mall area. Well, and then Arizona, but then Harvard, you know, that, that training, that had to be very interesting. That was a spectacular opportunity. You know, the, uh, just about every uh, NFL orthopedic surgeon takes a fellow, and a fellowship is just a year of additional training after you've right. finished orthopedic residency. And I was very fortunate. Um, there were 100 applicants for this job with, with uh, Dr. Bertram Zarens at uh, Harvard Mass General Hospital where we took care of the Bruins and the Patriots and the uh, New England Revolution uh, soccer team, MLS team, and all the Harvard sports teams that year. And for whatever reason, Bert uh, was kind enough to choose me. So what a great opportunity that was. Uh, I got to travel with the Patriots. I was with them down at camp and with them basically the whole year. So what a great training experience. And now you're at SDSU. Right. And then you, you do other places. I know you, you also do the yeah, I've been in practice in Sioux Falls for 16 years now, and I'm a Sioux Falls kid. My dad's a OBGYN, still practicing down in yeah. Sioux Falls, and my, married my high school sweetheart from Sioux Falls. So it was just natural. When we finished training, we would come back home again. Yeah. And uh, I've been the team doctor at O'Gorman High School and Washington High School and Dakota State University, and I've been the only team orthopedic surgeon the Sioux Falls Storm have ever had, have ever had. and now for seven years I've been fortunate to serve as the team physician for SDSU. So, uh, you know, sports... Medicine is certainly one of the things, well, that's what you really, your interest is. But you do general surgery. I mean, you do hips and elderly, you do shoulders and hands and wrists. And so really, uh, you lend the opportunity for all of you to take the opportunity to call in your questions. I think this is, this is a, a, a great uh, expert to lean on, one 376 6225 so um, what is the most common surgery that you do? I probably do knee arthroscopy more than anything else. Um, you know, I'll typically in a year do about 700 surgeries and uh, maybe close to half of those will involve scoping the knee either to debride some torn cartilage out of the joint, repair some torn cartilage, or reconstruct or repair a ligamentous structure like the anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL. Yep. And if, if uh, you know, I know that there's a lot that you can do. I mean, you can fix the things that are there. You can uh, clean the tear, tears and, and so on. Then, but eventually, an older guy or gal will sometimes need an artificial knee. That's absolutely true. Uh, no, no matter what you it. do. Right, right. You can maybe delay that by having good general health, keeping your weight under control, maintaining your cardiovascular fitness, the tone and uh, of your muscles, the... Uh, the flexibility of uh, your knee joints, uh, maybe taking some supplements may stave off uh, the ravages of arthritis for a while. But eventually, uh, if you have osteoarthritis of the knee and you live long enough, it's likely you'll come to need a knee joint replacement. Right. Uh, you know, there was, uh, while I mean, I'm an internist, a non-surgeon, and of course, if I can find a fault with a surgeon, I will. You know, that's my, that's my uh, duty. I, I'm supposed to do that. Traditionally, that's been our job, you know. And, um, but one of the uh, stories is uh, bad osteoarthritis and scoping for it. And there's been criticism that too many people have had scopes and you go in there and you kind of clean it out and they compared it to sham surgery and they didn't find a lot of difference. Right, now, right. defend yourself. Well, uh, I, I think number one, I, I don't have to defend myself because I shouldn't be doing knee arthroscopy for osteoarthritis. It's been clearly shown, and, and the study that you referenced was done at a VA medical center. And just briefly for the people at home, what they did was they, they took a group of people, they split them in half, half of them, they took the OR, they just 
put holes in their knee, cut the knee like they did an arthroscopic debridement, like they went in and cleaned things up. And in the other half, they actually did the procedure and they followed them for a couple of years and they really couldn't see any significant difference in how those people did. So as, as a result, and that happened when I was in residency, that that paper right. was published and, and, and it kind of gelled with what we knew internally. And we'd always been taught, you don't scope knees for osteoarthritis because you can't cure osteoarthritis through the scope. Now there may be some cases in which a patient who's got some underlying osteoarthritis also has a torn piece of cartilage or a loose body floating See, now around that's, the See, that's my thinking. It, it, it isn't an all or none. There are times when it's indicated. Right, right. So uh, you and I both got a little arthritis in our knees and if we came into the surgeon and said, I got this piece of something that's floating around in my joint, I wish you'd get that out of there. I can tell you because I had that exact procedure done four or five years ago, it makes a world of difference in your quality of life. The, the, um, and let me ask you one other pet question of mine as a general internist. Uh, people have, I've got bone on bone. I mean, everybody says that. That's a, that's a classic, my joints hurt when I work. I mean, you know, when I walk on them, I can't walk on my knees because they hurt. And I know the classic study where half of the people who had that bone on bone, they divided them into two groups matched pairs, I mean, you know, so that it was really an identical group. One group was forced to exercise, and the other force was, the other group was allowed to just sit on the couch, right? right? And the, you know, the people who, uh, and, and so, I mean, I've said it the same, same story a million times. Who do you think did better, had less pain, improved, uh, had less need for surgery eventually, and, uh, and, uh, just did better in general. It was the exercises. Right. Right. Let's take that story and, and go with it. Well, what I tell my patients is that uh, it's clear, not only from that initial study, but from every study that followed it, that the bigger and stronger your quadriceps muscle is, the less pain and trouble you'll have with your joint. So when we see a person with osteoarthritis who comes in for initial consultation, we almost always recommend non-surgical management initially. And that involves a variety of things, but maybe cheap. And maybe the first thing I talk to them about is regular exercise. Get on a treadmill, do some walking. Get on the bike and do some riding. Uh, get in the pool and do some swimming. Or get on the elliptical. And then do some strength training for the quadricep, the hamstring, and the calf muscles. Uh, and as you said, uh, it's been clear from the literature that strengthening that quadricep decreases their symptoms. And some people respond beautifully to that. As you know, it's not the same for everybody, right? right. And some people won't, and they'll require a surgical intervention. Well, I, I, I think of the same story as the shoulder. The guy has an injury in his shoulder. His shoulder really hurts to move it. He doesn't move it, it freezes. Right. And, and, and then you're really in trouble to try to get moving. You just got to keep using it or you'll lose it. Absolutely. And that's no with the knee and the hip and everything. Yep. Yep. And they've shown some cartilage buildup. I mean, you know, we, I, the other story I always say is, you know, we have not one cell in our body that isn't replaced every seven or eight years. And, so, and we're constantly healing. We have to break a bone, it heals. Even if you're 95, you know, it, it's going to heal. So that you can reconstruct your joints if you keep moving them and exercise to some degree. Would you, would you, is that a stretch? A yeah, little. Yeah, before we got on camera, you said it's okay if I, if I occasionally disagree with <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one I think we may have a problem with. Yeah, there, <laughs> there, there really is no good data that you can, after the age of 14, recreate the hyaline articular cartilage. That's that beautiful, smooth, white stuff that you see when you take a chicken joint apart. Yep. Once you are done growing, what you've got is all you get. And they've looked at this a number of different ways. You know, there's this uh, idea that we all have, and rightfully so, that if you exercise a part of your body, it'll get bigger and get stronger, right? Right. So they looked at triathletes who use their knees a tremendous amount, and they said, you know, if you can strengthen and thicken that articular cartilage layer, who better to have more of that than these guys? And Didn't they have don't it. have more. No, what you've got at 14 is what you're going to keep, and you better take good care of it. It's all you're going to get. Can you do something to enhance the cartilage that you have before 14? Not that we're aware of, but you know, the one thing that may slow down the degradation is this glucosamine and chondroitin. And you know, the, the studies are kind of split on that. About half of them, Rick, have shown some improvement, yeah. about half haven't. But I still take this stuff myself, and I still recommend it for my patients. I'm not selling it, yeah. but. You know, there were a couple of studies that came out of the UK that showed that it actually may slow down the progression of osteoarthritis. And I'm not shilling for any company out there selling right. this stuff, but it might make a difference. Yeah. I, and I also think that uh, we don't know about bones and joints uh, with the vitamin D, but we, we do know the bone deposition is very important. And Mal, 
you know, it just, just uh, it's not osteoporosis, it's osteomalacia. It's, it's crappy you know, protein uh, weakened bones. Why not the cartilage too if you're not have enough vitamin D? And we recommend vitamin D for everybody. It's a supplement for children. So, uh, you know, not that I have any data, I don't. I mean, I'm a, I like to say that I'm a scientist. I guess I'm a parascientist. So you threw in the, the chondroitin sulfate, hey, I'll throw in the vitamin and D. And I totally agree with you on the vitamin D. I mean, my <laughs> patients, a lot of my older patients have got significant osteopenia or osteomalacia. Maybe it doesn't rise to the level of osteoporosis. And there's no question that I think the best initial treatment for that is vitamin D supplementation and calcium, followed by or including weight training exercises to load the long bones in your body with weight because that stimulates them to pick up that calcium uh, that the vitamin D has allowed to get into your bloodstream. Right. And you can strengthen your bones that way. There we go. Yep. Dealing with musculoskeletal injury or degeneration isn't a one tricky trick pony treatment. Seldom starts with a joint replacement. There are often options and treatments available to prevent or at least postpone major surgery and even some life choices that can begin now to increase the lifetime usefulness of your bones, joints, and muscles. Soft tissue surgery, you can rotator cuff repairs, um, you can do knee scopes, ACL reconstructions is, is trying to prevent the need for um, a knee replacement or a rotator cuff repair, trying to prevent the need for a shoulder replacement. If you tear your cuff, you can go and need um, shoulder replacement if you don't fix it. You can get what they call rotator cuff arthropathy, where uh, uh, with a chronic deficient rotator cuff, you develop severe arthritis in your shoulder over the year. The, the, not immediately, but a certain time frame that develops. And if you don't fix your cuff, then you're going to need a shoulder replacement, and that's a much bigger ordeal for a patient. Same with the knee tear an ACL and you can stabilize a knee that's loose, you can prevent the need for a total knee, at least by time. We're not sure how long, but we do know that it makes the knee more stable and uh, prolongs the uh, possibility. It's more frequent in women to have uh, ACL tears, more frequent that the women have tears that are not in contact. A male, when he tears his ACL, it's more common that there's a collision or direct contact. Uh, women are much more uh, apt to tear with non-contact than a male is. There's lots of theories of why um, in regards to the morphology or the, the, the shape of the bone uh, and the area uh, in the femur where the ACL attaches and um, is it tighter in a woman. Um, there's some hormonal questions. Um, is it based on the, the uh, women's hormones versus men's hormones, why they're more apt to tear with not having a collision. You almost never see an ACL tear in an adolescent, which is interesting. You know, teenagers, preteens, you'll see them, but almost never in a child. And their bodies, uh, you know, can just twist like Gumby, and and they don't tend to to tear or fracture. For every every pound you're over your ideal body weight, or you can check the BMI scales, and there's some controversy there what it should be, but when you're overweight, the amount of pressure that it puts on your your lower extremity joints mainly, um, your ankles, your knees, and your hips is incredible. And especially your knees don't tolerate the weight uh, based on the style of the joint versus a ball and socket at your hip. Certainly the, the increased pressure, especially on the inside of your knees, um, when you're carrying extra weight, it's the best thing you could do for yourself. And to, to keep you away from a, an orthopedic surgeon. Arthritis can stabilize. can't reverse a whole lot, but if you were 100 pounds overweight and you lost that weight, it would significantly delay the progression of arthritis. You pick your mom and dad, and whatever you get from them, you got. And unfortunately, it could be cancer, it might be something minor like thyroid problems, diabetes, or arthritis. Life inhibiting, not life threatening. And, uh, but it can be pretty debilitating. And if it gets to the point you need surgery, you do it. But prevention is best always. Light exercise, not high impact. Swimming, biking, elliptical trainers, rowing machines. Um, good healthy diet. Good, good answers there, John. Thank you. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions. Uh, here's a 68-year-old amputated leg, seven foot, uh, seven inches by four inch foot knee, new knee, needed 
leg is prosthetic. Okay, I'm 68, I have an amputated leg, seven inches above the knee. Would, get, uh, would getting a replacement knee work with my prosthetic leg? So I'm unclear here, Rick. Is this an above or below knee amputation? And, uh, seven inches above the knee, so he's thinking about the other knee. Oh, right? the other knee. Oh, okay. All right, good. Well, uh, you know, it, it's hard, obviously, to make a diagnosis and uh, recommend treatment uh, from a question like yeah. this. I would recommend that he see his primary care physician or his local orthopedic surgeon for a workup. X-rays, evaluation, history, physical examination, and then talk about treatment options and choose the best one for him. He's going to be laid up for a while as he repairs that knee, and then he's really going to be laid up. That's a tough deal. But it, it's not a, an absolute contraindication to doing the other knee, and we've certainly done a lot of these on amputees because when their good leg goes bad, then they're really in a world of hurt. So, yeah. you, so if they need surgical care for that knee, it needs to be done. You, you need to do it. The most important thing would be to make sure that knee is in good shape before the surgery so that it can come out fast. Right. Great concept, what we call prehab preoperative rehabilitation. Almost all of our patients benefit from an exercise routine before they go to the operating room. Somebody asked the difference between vitamin D and D3, and the answer is uh, there's two kinds of vitamin D, but most of the kind that you get that are in the lower dose is the D3. Uh, some question, what's wrong with my second largest toe? Pain occurs when I walk, especially down steps. Depends on where the pain is. It can be a hammer toe with a, a callus, a painful callus forming on the top of it, or it can be a, a claw toe in which the, the toe is actually pushing a bone called the metatarsal head down into the bottom of the foot. Oh, we've got a foot here, beautiful. Yes. All right, so. Okay, so. Whichever, I guess we're looking over here. So uh, a hammer toe, uh, the toe will cock up like this and they'll become a painful callus on the top of the toe. And sometimes with a, a claw toe, the uh, toe will actually force this bone, the second metatarsal head, down into the bottom of the foot. So when the patient stands, they're putting too much pressure here. On, on this spot, right on there. That, on that spot, on the right bottom. there, exactly. It's being pushed down. And, and you can uh, frequently uh, find that on physical examination. You put your thumb right on it, you see there's a callus there because there's a pattern of weight on that and it can be painful. Both of those can be uh, treated both non-surgically and surgically. And uh, it, it, Orthopedic Institute in Sioux Falls, uh, Dr. Eric Watson, my partner who's fellowship trained in foot and ankle surgery, he does a great job with this kind of treatment. Do you generally uh, you cut it you, or you remove it or what do you generally do? Depend, if, if it requires surgical treatment, it depends on whether it's a flexible or a fixed deformity. If it's a flexible deformity, you can rebalance the tendons to straighten the toe without cutting any bone out. If it's a fixed deformity, then it doesn't matter what you do with the tendons because the bones are already stuck in a position. Then you have to remove a little bit of bone to straighten the toe. Okay. So remove it, shorten it maybe sometimes. Yep, a little bit. Heartland, South Dakota. 90-year-old man lifting weights, broke or tore his meniscus in his right knee. Doc has said to remain active and no surgery. What do you think? Uh, great first choice. Uh, if the pain does not resolve within three months, may want to consider arthroscopic treatment. Okay. Arthroscopic treatment would be removal of the meniscus? Usually, usually in a 90-year-old, you wouldn't consider a meniscus repair. You'd go in and just trim out the torn portion to get rid of his pain. But that's not orth uh, arthroscopic re uh, repair. I mean, it's a, uh, on a osteoarthritis. That's a, that's a torn meniscus. Right. We're dealing primarily with the torn meniscus. Now, if you, if you did the workup and you found the patient had severe bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis, you might suggest to him, you know, if we go in there and just trim that out, you may be back here in six months with continued pain in your knee and you need to consider uh, whether injection therapy is appropriate or if at 90 he's still in good, excellent health, he may be a candidate for knee replacement. The, this guy's 90 and he's lifting weights and he's working and he's going. Right. I mean, so you he has a 10-year survival. You don't throw him out, right? No, you do not. Help, you got to help him. Right? Hey, you <laughs> might be 90 one day. Oh, God. Okay. Watertown, how to tell you... How do you tell if pain emanates from back or hip? Ah. So how do you dis dif differentiate back pain from hip pain? Oh, really good, good question. question. Yeah, I mean, you and I deal with this yeah. all the time. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, one of the back specialists at OI, but I see my share of back pain. People come in, I've taken care of their knee or their shoulder or something like that. They come in and say, Pete, I've got a problem with my hip hurting. Um, so there are a bunch of clues you can use. You want to know what the location of the pain is, the character of the pain, is there any back pain, what things make it worse, what things make it better. Uh, X-rays of the hip will give you a lot of information. Physical examination of the back and the hip can help you a lot. And then if, if you're still not sure, an MRI scan of the lumbar spine is kind of our go-to test for that.
but in general, hip pain is in the groin and back pain is down the leg or right. in the back or what, what would you Absolutely, 100% I agree. Pain in the groin almost always from the ball and socket joint. Where you can get fooled though is pain coming down the back or the outside of the hip it may be bursitis or what we call proximal iliotibial band syndrome, or it could be referred pain from the back. Sometimes it can be tough to tell. Okay. Uh, how long does it take for a fractured rib to heal? And what do you do for, uh, for such a thing? Okay. Uh, on average, about six weeks for, uh, for the rib to heal. Uh, and it, usually all that's required is to control the initial pain. Uh, anybody who's had a cracked or bruised rib knows it is excruciatingly painful. With every deep breath, every time you roll over in bed or try to get out of a chair, it just kills. Uh, usually a belly, bi belly binder support that attaches with Velcro to get some compression on that and the use of some pain medication as needed and some time to heal. Okay, but I may run a little disagreement with you on the belly, on the binder. If, if indeed you have, uh, and, and this is what the medical doctors say, if you have a fractured rib and it hurts and you do a binder, it'll feel a lot better, but oftentimes they'll get pneumonia that right. follows. So right. that has to right. be very carefully done and very carefully monitored. I've, I've done a binder, a rib binder, and followed it with pneumonia and had a problem. So yeah. Yeah. we had- Good point. All right. Good point. Well, um, as the proverb says, physician, heal thyself. As much as we would like to think otherwise, even doctors sometimes need medical assistance as we live our lives. We are not immune from the diseases we treat or from doing those things that push our bodies to break. The field of orthopedics is for uh, musculoskeletal types of injuries or diseases, and that can include um, nerves, uh, muscles, tendons, bones, uh, any, any kind of mechanical type of thing for the body then. Well, of course, orthopedics, you can have uh, the wide range of age groups. You can have problems with uh, children uh, and then um, teenagers, young adults, and, and then older people also. So it, it covers the whole range of <coughs> uh, age. They call the, the item boomeritis, where the baby boomers who are getting uh, into retirement age, still want to be active, and still want to do things. And so the indications for some types of surgeries like total hips and total uh, knees are uh, being changed and the um, people are getting younger and younger to have these, these problems so they can continue on with their, um, with their lifestyle. Uh, in the past it's been um, kind of what you were doing at the time of the surgery for a total hip or a total knee, that's the kind of the level you should stay at uh, to protect the components from uh, getting loose or having other problems that would require some kind of revision or replacement of the part. But nowadays, uh, the research is trying to find materials that will stand up to um, the stress of, of sports activity and, or at least exercise activity. I guess I'm maybe a typical boomer, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I've try to play basketball uh, three times a week in the mornings and so um, I have had uh, a scope surgery on one of my knees and then uh, a little over a year ago, a year and a half, so uh, I ruptured a, a tendon off the top of my kneecap and had to have that uh, repaired and replaced and uh, try to recover from that and then try to get back to, to my basketball. It's not like a knee scope where you just go in there and look around and, and remove a torn cartilage and trim up some things and you can get back and have your motion back right away. Uh, it required uh, a brace until the tissue had healed enough where it was strong enough to be able to start moving the knee. And then you had to have your, your rehab, uh, get your strength back and get all the motion back and things like that. So it took me six months before I got back to playing. The joints are nourished by the fluid that's inside the joint and not really from the blood supply. So you have to have the circulation of the fluid around the joint and that requires the motion. And so that's, that's why it's really important to keep the motion going with the joints. You may have to change your ways with the total joint. Uh, before that, you may have to back off and I try not to tell people that they can't do anything, but maybe you can't do it as often or as long as you used to be able to do it. But, so you just have to modify 
what you do and still be able to do some things that you really like to do. What I tell my patients is uh, my job with the surgery is about 20% of the recovery and their job is 80% and part of that has to do with getting, getting started with physical therapy first. So boomeritis, I mean, you know, you, uh, I'm, uh, as a, a um, yeah, you, you and I are both young guys, uh, but we're still active. Are you physically active? Are you? Oh, yes. What do you do? I have to th I get uh, in the gym uh, during the winter months. In the summer months, my release is when I get done with work, I go to the driving range or the, or the golf course. So you're a golfer. Yep. Yep. And John is, is a basketball player. Yeah, John, uh, I, I got to tell you, Rick, I have just tremendous respect for John Ramsey. He's been doing this job a long time. He is a wise man, uh, and uh, he's a patient of mine. I'm the surgeon that fixed his knee yeah. when, it, when it tore up. And, uh, and I'll add, he's on 24-7. I mean, he's on call. 24 hours a day, seven yeah, days a right. week, and has been so. I mean, he takes a break here and there, okay. but he has served our community for yeah. accidents and trouble. I mean, you know, what? And did, if you call John, you never hear, oh, I can't do that. He always says, I'll take care of it. You yeah. Know, he's just a fantastic guy. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, you and I stay active. John's a little bit older than uh, we are, but John, you know, is also a, a spectacular athlete. You know, he's an SDSU athlete, and so uh, his body may be put together a little better than yours and mine. So yeah. at his age, he's still playing basketball three days a week, and I don't know about you, but I'm not doing that yeah. anymore. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he ran into one of those problems that a lot of baby boomer type people do. Is, uh, you know, he had essentially an overused traumatic injury, it tore his quadriceps tendon, and it required surgical repair. But now he's back playing basketball again. He can't keep the guy down. No, you can't say, you can't do this, John, because he's <laughs> going to keep doing it. He, th uh, this uh, introduces a, the topic of ulcer uh, and, and uh, decubitus ulcer uh, care, uh, foot ulcer care. Uh, infectious uh, ulcer uh, problems that involve the bone. Orthopedics have to deal with this all the time. Right. And um, you know, through the years, I've learned that I can lean on uh, Dr. Ramsey uh, to help to breed and clean and manage and get a wound through the long haul that it takes to heal. Yeah. And that's one of the things. What's your take on orthopedic? I mean, we all like to run in, play the game, be done with it, go to the locker room, they're healed, they go home, they're great, they're, everything is good. Well, and I'm one of those guys, you know, that's why after orthopedic residency, I went and did that additional sports medicine training because, at least for me, that is tremendously satisfying. The, the young patients who come to me needing help, they're very active, they want to get back to their active lifestyle. I can fix them and they can go back to doing what they want to do and, and as you know as a practitioner that's tremendously satisfying. There's, uh, there's a need however for as you said taking care of these long-term problems and, and Dr. Ramsey does a fantastic job with that and I am fortunate that I'm in a large group of orthopedic surgeons some of whom have specialty training in taking care of exactly those kinds of problems and it usually takes a multidisciplinary approach as you know we often involve the plastic surgeons for wound coverage and that kind of thing and uh, the wound care team in the hospital are very helpful for that as well. Yeah as, I, as a geriatrician I take care of all of these old people and uh, many of whom are home and lifting weights at 90 and some of them are in the nursing home and struggling with ulcers and sores and infections and um, and we just have to deal with all those things when you got the young guy that goes back to you know work that's a great deal right, right. we have to deal with it all we have a call oh and I wanted to, to get back to this caller the the gentleman who had the knee replacement uh, in uh, was asking about knee replacement he had a below the knee amputation, okay. not an above the knee amputation. He has two knees. And the knee that's bothering him is the knee of the amputated lower leg. Yep. Now, have you dealt with that much? Yeah, I have. And, you know, I do about 200 knee replacements a year, so a lot of them. Uh, but uh, in the last 20 years, I've only done one knee replacement on an amputee limb. So this is a below knee amputation. Below his knee, he has lost his limb. He probably uses a prosthesis daily yep. to walk around. And now he's developed osteoarthritis in that knee. Uh, not an uncommon problem, but it's uncommon for them to come to the surgeon to, to, to need knee replacement. And the reason for this is that, uh, number one, their activity level is usually not that great because of the amputation. And number two, they are so reliant on that knee that they really often don't want to take time out 
to get the knee replaced, unlike the person who's used to kind of walking around with no pain. This is a person who's dealt with adversity there, you know, for a long yes. time, and they usually will just kind of soldier on through it, if you will. But the knee can be replaced. Uh, it, technically, it's a little bit more difficult because we don't have all the tibia to work with, right. but it, technically it can be done. So uh, I would encourage him to go and see a qualified orthopedic surgeon and have, the, have this uh, explored as an option for as him. As an option. Yeah. So I had a, a patient who had a uh, motor a vehicle accident that uh, cut off his spine mid-thoracic. So he's got his upper extremities, uh, lost everything below. Right. And he's dealt with his 20 plus years. Uh, so he's in a motor vehicle accident and his shoulders hurt. Now here's a man who really needs his shoulder. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, you can just, you can be so upset because why did this have to happen? But the truth is it did and he has had to deal with it. Uh, and fortunately we didn't have to do surgery. I think he got through it with rehabilitation and finally, you know, it took a year rehabilitation. I just saw a guy like that in Brookings a year ago. Did you send that guy to see him? Might have. <laughs> so, I think we treated him with rehab and injections and you know he's exactly that kind of guy. He's like used to work, dealing with adversity and he doesn't want to have a day where he can't use those shoulders because of surgery. So he'll do about anything he can to avoid it. And you know you think about uh, here is a man who exercises. He goes out and, and, and jogs every day. Oh he's in a wheelchair. So it's wheels every day. Uh, particularly through the summer when I see him out on the, on the track. Well, that's great on that gentleman with the, with the, uh, the knee. It can be done. It can be he done. can uh, ask can this be. question. Here's someone from Pierre. I have a herniated disc at L5S1 uh, and would like to know if traction will provide lasting benefits to the, for the problem. Traction can be helpful as a short-term short treatment as the disc heals. So a uh, herniated disc, uh, just briefly, uh, the disc is kind of like a jelly donut. It's got kind of a hard, fibrous covering around it. The inside of it is uh, much more viscous and fluid. And, it, and the outside of that hard part is called the annulus, and it's common for that annulus to tear. Sometimes a portion of that jelly on the inside will come out through the tear in the annulus. That's what we call a herniated disc. That can be painful because of the tear in the anus and it can be debilitating if there's a lot of pressure on one of the nerves that runs down your leg. And people who have dealt with sciatica know what that feels like. 90% uh, of these will heal on their own with non-surgical management in about three months. And traction can be an adjunct therapy to help that process during that period. Uh, for the 10% of people who don't get better, sometimes an injection is necessary and rarely surgery can be performed for those people. But the clue I have about going to surgery is when they're losing nerve function. Oh, yeah. It isn't the pain because right. the surgery doesn't really necessarily help the pain. Now, is that true or how would you call it? What? There are the people that, you know, have chronic pain after herniated disc. But you're right, the subset of people who have severe neurologic damage or what we call crescendo or worsening neurologic damage, they need to be evaluated by the surgeon soon or they'll lose permanent function. Right, so you start losing that foot, that foot drop is starting to happen, you need to move on it. Yep. Well, despite good training, proper warm up and attention to your form, you feel the pop that tells you something is wrong. Your successful recovery is dependent upon a partnership between you and your physical therapist. It was in a meet on my first event. I was doing gymnastics and I was doing a twisting move so and when I landed my foot was turned out so I was twisting while I landed and then I just felt a pop. It felt kind of just like I thought it felt just like kind of like a snap just like it broke or something so but it hurt really really bad. <laughs> I tried to kind of stand up a little bit and then I fell over and then I just like yelled so my coach knew that I was like down. I had an ACL reconstruction and a lateral meniscus um, like reconstruction <laughs> and well, they had scoped my meniscus, it was all through scope and then they put a cadaver graph in for my ACL. It was three weeks ago. One of the first things we're really working on right now, three weeks out with rehab, is working on motion. So one thing we can do is we can use a towel. And then she can use the towel to help pull her knee back to a level of, or an area of comfort. And once you're to that area, we'll hold it for about 15, 20 seconds, and then go ahead and extend. At this point, with her 
with her lateral meniscus repair, our biggest focus is on flexion or bending the knee. Uh, slowly, her extension will come to, or being able to straighten the knee out completely. This is where they put the graph in, and then this is where they put the, like, tubes, scope, this, uh, scope things in, and then mm -hmm. this is where they did my lateral meniscus. For three weeks out, this is ideal. Um, you know, her amount of scarring at the end in a year's time will be very minimal. It was painful about a week after surgery. I didn't go to school for that whole week because it was quite a bit of pain and I was really drowsy. And then the next week was pretty good. It was barely any pain then. She's doing very good. Um, at this point, like I said, our biggest thing is range of motion. Her range of motion is coming very good. Um, Haley's kind of your ideal athlete. I mean, she's very motivated, she's very confident, um, but she always tries to push herself to the next level, which is really great. And that's really what, uh, what makes my job fun, but it also helps push herself so that we are getting her back to gymnastics for next season. I've been mainly just icing to work on getting that swelling down, but otherwise I don't need any pain medication or any anti-inflammatory or anything. This is a situation that an athletic trainer works in, so not only looking at um, providing the care before events and practices, but also, in her case, rehab, very much a, a, a cost-effective way for a person um, to receive care in the high school itself. I've been here at uh, Brookings High School since August 1st, so this is my first high school experience. On a daily basis, I work with about 15 to 20. Um, for events, it can be up to 30, 40, especially with gymnastics meets or competitive cheer meets. I host home events, uh, but I do not travel except for state events. And we're very fortunate working with the AA schools in South Dakota that all AA schools have an athletic trainer available. So if, uh, for instance, last night uh, our girls basketball team played in Pierre, there was an athletic trainer at that event. And I'm very close with the other athletic trainers at the other AA schools. So we work very closely in being able to provide each other kind of that first report of this is what happened in the game, this is the injury that the person sustained, and this is what I've done for treatment. So really just trying to take that level of care to the next, to the next step. So that's, that's the classic story of the anterior cruciate ligament uh, issue. And uh, I know I, Judith Peterson, Peterson, who is a physician from Sioux Falls, a, a physiatrist rehab right. person, is making huge efforts in trying to educate the public about preventing ACL injury. Any right. comment ab about that? In the subset of uh, high school and college female basketball players, there's pretty good data that you can train them to land, jump stop, twist and turn uh, in a different fashion that can actually decrease their risk of tearing their ACL. And at OI we've got a program called Accelerate that is designed to do exactly that. Uh, in a, you know, I tore both of my ACLs playing football uh, and the, the football players I see, it doesn't matter what you do to them because it's usually a Im immediate forceful contact blow that hits the knee and it doesn't matter what you do it's going to go right yeah. so and it's primarily when somebody pushes the lower the lower leg forward correct right. or hits the upper body and twists it the opposite direction but you've got to have that rotational force at the knee to tear this thing well we have a animation that was done by Isaac uh, uh, Wyndham uh, about a couple of years ago. Isaac did this for our show we did. Uh, describe what we see, Peter. Well, this is a fantastic animation. We're looking at the knee from the side here, Rick. You can see the major bones. They've now taken away the collateral ligaments and the patella and then exploded the view so you can see the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments here. And now you're going to see Isaac going to show us how an ACL will tear in just a second here. Right now he's showing flexion and extension of the joint and how the ACL stabilizes the joint and then here as it goes into stress with extension and rotation you see the ACL tear which is a classic way that this occurs. Okay, extension and rotation. Yep. So I mean that's that twist and then the, the pop, the pop. classic pop. You know that thing 
that ACL is basically a cable running between those two bones. And as the bones twist too far, the ACL stretches and it will just go. So if we take the patella away from the front of our knee joint here, we can see the ACL right running up. right in the front of the knee here. That's our ACL right there. This, this? Right there, that structure right there, exactly. And then it's going up? Yep, it's attached to the femur right up here, Rick, and it's attached to the tibia right down here. And as the knee goes into extension, and then it Now, what do you mean extension? So extension is straightening, yeah. and flexion is bending. So as it goes into extension, the ACL gets tight, and then it will rotate, typically like this. And as that occurs, the ACL will get pulled, pulled, pulled until it'll just rip. And then something stretches it this way, out or in? Usually extension and rotation like that is how it occurs. And then, and you feel that, uh, as I said, I've had, I've torn both of mine, so I know what that feels like. And it's the sense that, and this is, the kids come in there and stand into the office and tell me this all the time. It's like, they say, they'll put their fists together and say, my bones did this. Yeah. They actually come apart, and then they know they slide back into place. And as they come apart, they pull on that cable until it just blows right in the middle or up at the top of it usually. And, and I liken it to, I tell them, if you took a big heavy rope and you tied one end to a tree and you tied the other end to the, the bumper on your pickup and you drove away from the tree, you know what's going to happen, right? That rope's going to stretch, fray, and then it's going to blow up right in the middle. And that's what that pop is that those kids are feeling right. when your ACL goes. So my comment is, uh, you know, and, and I'm a runner or a jogger or a slow runner or whatever you call it, but uh, if I come down on a straight knee, and I, that happens mostly when you're going downhill, that's why you don't run into this problem in South Dakota, there's no hills. Just a joke. But if you're going downhill like you are in Atlanta, your knee gets a chance to straighten out more. And then you come down on a straight knee and it is traumatic. If you come down on a bent knee, then there's spring. Right, and if right. you're on a bent knee, you're protected, okay. correct? Absolutely. And, and what I would suggest to you is that springiness that you're feeling yeah. is that with your knee is bent, your quadricep is contracting to prevent your knee from jackknifing, from fully flexing. Yeah. Okay? And so as you load that foot, as your foot hits the ground, that energy gets absorbed by your quadricep muscle. If you come down with your knee fully straight, your quad is not firing, it's not doing anything, and all the force goes right up through the bones of your knee, and you feel that, and you, any runner knows yeah. that doesn't feel good. No, right. and, and, and actually, uh, there's no question about it. You look a little bit funny, walk, running around like Groucho Marx, nobody under, well, most of our audience may remember that, but you come down on a bent knee, you've got to be lower, you run a little lower, and it, it, it makes all the difference. If you're playing sports with a, a bent knee, you're less risk. Right, same deal. Am I right? Absolutely. When I tore both my ACLs, it was with a knee extended, and I got hit up above in a tackle, and it just twisted my knee like that. You know Rich Greeno. It, Probably half the people that are watching this know Rich Greeno. They are either a student of his, a track athlete of yeah. his, or they've seen him at a track, uh, track event someplace. Well, if you watch Rich run, Rich doesn't run anymore, he's biking now, but when you watch him run, he did that exact same thing. He never straightened his leg out, you know. And heck, he was running into his 80s. Yeah, well, I, I'm not there yet, but I hope I, I can. <laughs> you know, we've got uh, tons of questions. I'm going to just fire them okay, fast. Let's good. go. All right, quick answers. A lump in the wrist, a cyst-like but hard, calcified near the thumb, painful, any ideas? Uh, usually osteoarthritis at the basilar joint of the thumb can be treated with rehabilitation, bracing, injections, and sometimes surgery. A person wears a hand brace and her hand goes numb. What's the reason? Probably carpal tunnel syndrome. EMG nerve conduction studies to confirm the diagnosis. A trial of non-surgical or non-invasive treatment, possibly an injection, often goes to surgery. Very quick little surgery works great. And don't do the wrist thing too tight because maybe that's pushing on the nerve yeah, too. Yeah, counter, counter helpful. Maurice Iowa, female, 75-year-old man, has plantar's fasciitis. What can he do about it? Started four months ago. Plantar fasciitis, plantar fasciitis runner's is, problem. Right. Uh, inflammation of the plantar fascia when it attaches to the heel bone. Uh, orthotics, stretching exercises if they're unsuccessful, and injection. Uh, and rarely, rarely surgery is required. And, there, and it's right there on the bottom. Exactly. Of it's kind of fan-shaped, attaching at the base of the toes, and it comes down, and one heavy big cord that attaches to the heel bone here. A lot of times uh, x-ray will show a little spur there. It's really not the spur that's the problem. It's pain in the plantar fascia right where it attaches to the heel bone. It's the dance you do getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and the treatment is support hose, did you say? Support, support. Or orthotics, orthotics and stretching exercises to start with. Yeah. Sioux Falls, I have a trach 
trochanteric bursitis was looking for a way to help with the pain. Pain right on the outside of the hip. It's that bursa there. Right, right. What do you do? IT band stretching exercises, heat or ice, anti-inflammatories, occasionally an injection in that area would be helpful. Uh, what is the average recuperation time for a total hip? Uh, well, back to what? Uh, you know, they're usually walking great without any assistive device at about two weeks, back to normal activity at about three months. All right. So All right. That, well, I think we'll do, uh, we have time for one more question. The man loses balance and strength, has weakness of muscles. He's on vitamin B12 and D. How can he regain strength in his legs? Uh, that's a better question for you than for me, I think. All right, and the answer is try to keep walking. <laughs> try to keep walking. All right, so here. In 1974, in Ethiopia's Awash Valley, a 3.2 million year old skeleton of an ape was discovered that was different than other ape skeletons. The knee bone shape, along with pelvic architecture, indicated that this ape was walking upright. As the Beatles' music, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, was playing in the background, archaeologists speculated that this could be the long-sought link between apes and humans, and the upright walking individual was famously nicknamed Lucy. Her brain was small and ape-like, but she walked upright. This was evidence that the upright position might have come first. They speculated that standing tall allowed for the evolutionary advantage of having a better view of approaching enemy or mate, and all the rest followed. Could it be that the special design of an upright knee allowed for the first big step toward the evolution of humanity? And what is so special about this design? Well, the knee is a hinge joint, mostly held together with four ligaments. The two collateral ligaments run along the inner and outer sides of the bone here, here. To keep the, our legs from bending inward, knock-kneed, or outward bow-legged. The more noteworthy structures, however, are the two tough fibrous ribbon ligaments, which cross each other front to back in the inside of the knee, forming an X. This explains why they're called the cruciate or cross-like ligaments. The anterior cruciate ligament, or the ACL, starts at the back of the thigh bone, or femur above, and crosses to connect at the front of the shin bone, or tibia below. So it comes from here and crosses over. And it keeps the lower leg from sliding forward. The posterior cruciate ligament, or the PCL, starts at the front of the thigh bone, crosses to the back of the shin bone, and keeps the lower leg from going backwards. What is so ingenious is how these crossing ribbons provide for such stability and yet at the same time allow for the bending of the knee. So it is with, as Gerard Manley Hopkins, the priest poet, said, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. So, any take-home thoughts on the cruciate ligament comment? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I deal with ACL tears and re reconstruction and rehabilitation every day. Today I did three ACL reconstructions. I got another one to do tomorrow. What is the most amazing thing about ACL reconstruction? I, you know, when I'm talking to my patients about this operation before we do it, I kind of give them a little bit of the history, the evolution of ACL surgery. A lot of your audience will remember Joe Willie Namath. Joe Willie Namath had, I think, like 12 operations on his knees. Well, the whole reason that this happened was because he tore both of his ACLs. And in that day, in the late 60s, early 70s, ACL reconstruction did not exist. And the surgeries that were, they were doing for Joe Namath simply didn't work. Probably for 50 or 60 years, orthopedic surgeons tried to go in and repair the ACL. When they found out that wouldn't work, they'd try taking ligaments and tendons from other parts of the knee and rerouting them to try to stabilize the knee. That really didn't work very well either. There was a, a revolution in ACL reconstruction. It happened in 1973. A, a surgeon at the University of Wisconsin named Clancy figured out, well, if I can't repair this ACL, maybe I can make a new one. 
And he started doing this crazy operation in dogs, and it worked. And then he started doing it in people, and it worked. And I've had that operation done on both my knees. Tom Brady's had it done. Jerry Rice had it done. Uh, numerous well-known athletes have had it done. And the concept is the ACL tears, it can't heal, you can't repair it. You've got to put a new one in place for people. And that has allowed athletes to go back to their prior level of activity and compete on a world stage again. All right. Well, we so much appreciate your joining us. That's a nice final point. That closes the book for our show on orthopedic medicine. To quote former Chicago Bears coach Mike Ditka, I really believe the only way to stay healthy is to eat properly, get your rest and exercise. If you don't exercise and do the other two, I still don't think it's going to help you that much. You got to listen to the coach. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Rick. What a pleasure. In part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.